Good evening, and welcome to the Southwest Texas Annual Conference Late Hour. My name is Chantel Sims, and I'm going to be your worship leader for this evening. To our presiding prelate, Bishop Vashon Murphy McKenzie, our Episcopal Supervisor, Dr. Stan McKenzie, Episcopal Supervisor, Clady Davis, to our International WMS President, Dr. Deborah Taylor King, to our host presiding elders, Reverend Pamela Rivera and Reverend Dr. Raymond Bryant. To our newly elected lay president of the 10th district, Dr. Roger Moore. To the president of the Southwest Texas Conference lay organization, Sister Vanessa Crawford. To the Kelly L. Maynard lay organization of Metropolitan AME Church president, Sister Alfay Washington. I greet each and every one of you with the love of Jesus. Our program is outlined as follows. We will have our prayer, which will be led by uh, Brother Willie Taylor. Scripture will be read by Sister Pat, Rock Rock Pat Richardson. The welcome will be done by Sister Alfay Washington. We will have our memorial and then the offering led by Brother Williams, William Taylor. We will have a musical selection by Sister Maddie Robinson. Our, we'll have the introduction of the speaker and the speaker, Reverend John McCormick, will also do the invitation. We will then have comments by our conference president, Sister Vanessa Crawford, the 10th District Lay Organization president, Dr. Roderick Moore, followed by our bishop, Bishop Vashon Murphy McKenzie. Then we will, at the end, ending, we will have the lay benediction, which will be led by Sister Maddie Robinson. Thank you, and I hope you all enjoy the service. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious and heavenly Father, I come to you tonight with a humble heart. Thank you for allowing us to see one more day. Heavenly Father, we need you now more than we have ever needed you before. Come into this place, O Lord. Father, to forgive us for all of our sins that we have done by thought, word, or deed against you. I ask you to straighten out the crooked path, straighten out the crooked path, Lord. Soften the hardened hearts and humble your leaders. Remove the spirit of fear and replace it with confidence. Bless your pastors that they deliver the word to the people they cannot see. Equip them with an enormous amount of strength and faith so the church may be able to carry on. Help us, O oh Lord, as you keep up us, your disciples, during this pandemic. And God, when we have done all we can do on this earth, I ask that you give us a place in your kingdom where we can serve and please you for the rest of our days. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our scripture this evening comes from Micah 6, chapter 8, verse. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. It says, He has showed you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. This ends the reading of our scripture. May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing and doing of his word. Good evening. We, the laity of the Southwest Texas Conference, are exceedingly glad that you have joined us this evening for this, our lay emphasis service. We extend a heartfelt welcome to each of you. We pray God's continuous blessings on you and yours during these perilous times. We hope and pray that you will be spiritually blessed by your sharing. On behalf of the Southwest Texas Conference Laity, officers and members, you are truly welcome once, twice, thrice. To God be the glory.
Good evening. This is part of the program that each one of you can participate. We're asking for a $25 donation. And you can give it through the 10th district, give the fire, or cash out. If you're writing the check, make it payable to the 10th Episcopal District. And we thank you.
to Bishop McKenzie, to Supervisor Dr. Stan McKenzie, uh, to Dr. Deborah Taylor King, President of the International Women's Missionary Society, to Dr. Roderick Moore, President of the 10th District Lay Organization, to Sister Vanessa Meredith, President of the Southwest Texas Lay Organization, and to Sister Alfe Washington, the local lay host. Uh, good evening. My name is John McCormick. I'm the pastor of Crossword Christian Center in Round Rock, Texas, and I have the privilege of bringing uh, the message. Let me thank the lay organization for this wonderful invitation. Let us pray. God, we've reached the preaching moment of this lay program. We understand that the word can't be preached unless the real preacher comes. So please come now and stand behind this sacred desk and boldly proclaim your word. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, the preparation and presentation of your word will be pleasing in your sight. For you are truly my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, we will begin our reading at verse 17, Luke chapter 5, beginning our reading at verse 17, Luke chapter 5, beginning at 17, verses 17 through 26, reading from the New Living Translation, you will find these words. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea as well as from Jerusalem. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to to the top of the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. And immediately as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. Some men carrying a mat, uh, carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat, they tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd, so they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. My brothers and sisters, for the next few minutes, I want to preach from the subject, Whatever it takes, re-energizing ministry. Whatever it takes, re-energizing ministry. My brothers and sisters, this is a virtual annual conference. Uh, I dare say that none of us have been here before. Instead of being uh, either in a hotel or in a sanctuary, we're actually participating via Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or some other type of platform. This is a different type of experience. It's a different type of worship experience, and it's a different type of meeting. But nonetheless, my brothers and sisters, what this tells us is that ministry must continue to go forward. Can I suggest that this particular pandemic has put us in a very interesting situation? 
Uh, it was when this pandemic orig originally uh, started that many of us thought that we would be back to our normal lives in about two or three weeks. But here we are over six months later, and it doesn't appear yet that we are able to resume to normal. Perhaps maybe what we should get adjusted to is a new normal that is facing us now. Now the question is, if this is in fact a new normal, then it actually forces us to re-examine what it means to do ministry. Re-examine the way that we used to do things because we cannot assume that we will be able to resume that type of activity. Can I suggest that, and I'm going to be bold and say, some of you have already heard it from your own pastors, that I believe that church as we knew it will never be that way again. And so the challenge is, if church is not going to be that way again, how are we still going to do what God has called us to do? Can I suggest that this particular story as told by Luke, also told by Matthew and Mark, provides some instructions to us and some inspiration as to perhaps how we can do ministry. Bible readers will understand that Jesus is back into his hometown. He's in a house and he's preaching and teaching. And there are some brothers, uh, some men, some four men, even though Luke doesn't tell us there are four, uh, it's told in another part of the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, there are four men who have a buddy who has been paralyzed. They understand that Jesus is in a house and now they're going to try to get that man in to see Jesus. There are four of them and and you see the story as they get ready to carry the man up to the house where Jesus is. The interesting thing is when they get there, they discover that the door is blocked. Put a pin there. I'm going to come back and pick that up in just a few minutes. And so rather than going home and deciding that they're not going to do anything, at least one of them had the bright idea to climb on top of the roof, remove some tiles, and lower the man down in front of Jesus. When we read the text, we we see that as the man is lowered, Jesus sees him and basically saves him right on the spot. Notice the order. Jesus saves him first and then heals him. Hopefully, if I have a few minutes left, I'll come back and pick that up as well. Can I suggest that if we look at this particular story, it really tells us something about ministry that we're facing now. You see, if we're really going to be effective in our ministry and post -COVID, in a post-COVID environment, we've got to develop develop a whatever it takes attitude. There are some things right here in this particular text that I think will help us get there if we want to reimagine how ministry really ought to be. The first thing we need to understand is that if we're going to be effective in our ministry, if we're really going to do it and hit a home run, we have to have some compassion for the concerns and the health and conditions of others. Let me see if I can say it again. We've got to have genuine one compassion for the conditions that others may find themselves into. Look at the text. It's right there. These four men actually understand that their brother, their friend, their road dog is paralyzed. He's in a bad condition, cannot walk for himself, but they want to get him, Lynn, to Jesus so that he can be healed. Notice what they do. They pick him up on a mat and they carry him to the house that Jesus is in. When they discover that they cannot get in in the front door. They go up on top of the roof and tear tiles off the top of the roof and lower him down. Can I suggest that their act in this particular time actually clearly demonstrates their concern for the condition of their brother. In fact, they were so concerned about his condition that they decided to pick him up and carry him. Now, the text doesn't tell us how long or how far they carried him, but suffice it to say, he could not assist them as they were carrying him. The only thing that that man could do was lie on the mat and watch his brothers or his friends take him to see Jesus. Can I suggest that it's one thing to say I care about somebody, but it's a whole nother thing to go the extra step to see that their needs are met. Can I suggest that one of the things that we need to do in this post-COVID or mid-COVID pandemic is we've got to 
have genuine concern for others, but watch this, the concern has to be more than a, cl- a, a, a glance. The, the concern has to be more than mere words. We've got to be willing to do some stuff uh, and do it differently uh, in order to make sure that people's needs are met. Now watch this, this particular charge is not just for the laity, but it's also for the clergy. We've got to engage in a new type of ministry uh, to meet the needs of people. Gone are the days where we just say, I'm praying for you. Gone are the days of, of where we just say, call me if you need me. Now you know they need you. You know the condition that they're in. So why don't you engage in helping them? Can I suggest that the moment that you engage in helping them, you've actually started doing ministry. Now here is the interesting thing that we all have learned at one point or another. Ministry and doing ministry is not easy. You see, it it takes an extra effort. It takes some extra concern because it's beyond our convenience. That is, we've got to sacrifice to help somebody. You see, it's fine and well for us to say, I'll pray for you, but I will tell you praying for them is adequate in one sense. But if God has given you something to actually help them, then after you get up off your knees, that's an opportunity for you to engage in worship. The text tells us right here that these men are engaging in help. They understand the condition that their brother is in, and they know that there's someone that can help them, help him. Now, here it is. Not only must there be a compassion, actually, for the condition of others, but there also must be a, a plan that is coordinated to actually help them. Look at the text. It's interesting. This particular man is paralyzed. They know that there's no other way to get him to Jesus other than carry him on a mat. Can I use my my, my, my biblical imagination? And I don't know if it happened this way, but I would just imagine that there was one brother on one corner, another brother on another corner, another brother on yet another corner, and another brother on yet another one. And so here they are uh, grabbing this particular mat, carrying this man. Each one of them has a corner to actually help him get to Jesus. But watch this. In order for them to help him get to Jesus, they had to have some coordination in their movement. In other words, somebody had to lead and somebody else had to follow. Somebody had to do, be the lookout and somebody had to respond to the instructions. Can I suggest, my brothers and sisters, that if we're going to do ministry in a, in a mid-COVID, post-COVID environment, then we've got to coordinate our plans of action. Wait a minute, I'm going there. That means that the pulpit and the pew have to be working and moving in one direction. You see, if we're really going to maximize our, our, our efforts and maximize the impact that we give in our ministries, we've got to all be on the same page. It's not enough for one person to be on one page and another person to be on another page. No, we have to all, pardon this expression, but we all have to be singing from the same sheet of music. And somebody here understands that it takes coordination for these brothers to get their their friend up to Jesus. What am I saying? When they get to the house, put a pin there, I'm coming back. Remember, the door is blocked and they have no way of getting him through the crowd. So what they do is someone, I don't know which brother it was, had the bright idea to climb on the roof and pull back the tiles in the roof and lower the brother. They all got there kind of some way or another. Hmm. Let me suggest that they got together and they decided that there was a plan that they needed to follow. They needed to coordinate uh, their plan so that they could get their brother safely uh, on the roof. Uh, I don't know if they had to climb a ladder. I don't know if they had to climb some stairs. I don't know if they had to climb a few steps. The only thing I know is they got on the roof uh, and the only way that they could get the brother on the roof to lower him down in the first place uh, is they had to coordinate their efforts. Uh, What I'm simply trying to tell a Southwest Texas conference, uh, if we're going to maximize uh, the ministries that we do, uh, we need to coordinate our efforts. Uh, We need to appreciate and support one another because we're all working for the same team. Uh, This is not uh, an opportunity uh, to get an MVP award. No, the MVP award has already been awarded. Uh, It's been awarded to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, And so what we're simply here to do is simply work out 
together to develop a plan to, to plan to help others who are in need. We've got to coordinate a plan. Here's one more thing before I take my seat. I promise I won't be long. I think I'm I'm trying to keep it about 15 minutes. Don't know if I'm going to make it, but I'm sure going to try. Not only must my brothers and sisters, must there be compassion uh, for the condition of others. Not only must there be a coordinated plan, uh, but here's the part that I like, and this is the part that I get excited about. Uh, but there must be a commitment uh, to carry the plan out uh, by any means necessary. Watch the text. Here is where we're going to get somebody's going to get me and feel where I'm going in just a second. Notice that the brothers wrote up on the house. They think at first blush, I, must, I assume, that they could walk into the, into the house and get their brother in front of Jesus. But watch this. They discovered that at they, as they got closer to the house, the door was blocked. Mm, somebody's going to get me in a minute. That is, the traditional access into the house was not an option. Now, my brothers and sisters, it would have been one thing for them to tell their brother, well, uh, brother man, uh, uh, dog, I, I'm sorry that I wouldn't be able, we couldn't get you to Jesus, uh, but maybe we'll try it again tomorrow. No, they were determined. They had dogged determination uh, to get their brother uh, his breakthrough. So what did they do? Uh, they decided to go outside of the box uh, and somebody had the wherewithal to look up and say, wait a minute, uh, there's an access on the roof, but somebody doesn't get it. Uh, watch this. You, you've got to have the imagination. Uh, they understood that the roof was totally covered but somebody had the bright idea to say even though there's cover on the roof uh, there are tiles up there and so let us separate the tiles uh, pull them back so uh, that there's an opening in the hole in the top of the roof uh, to lure our brother down somebody doesn't get it I'm simply trying to tell you that those brothers uh, instituted uh, or whatever it takes uh, by any means necessary attitude uh, come here somebody let me help you uh, this is for us clergy folk uh, and also for the laity. The traditional access into the church has been closed. Watch this COVID-19 has closed our church doors. Ah, but there ought to be some different access points into the church so that we can do ministry. Mm, I wish I could say that that was my idea, but I stole it from my friend and brother, the Reverend Dr. Cephas Martin, because he did a leadership retreat for Crosswork this last week, and he blew our minds by asking us how many access points are there to crosswork. My brothers and sisters, all I'm simply trying to tell you is if we're going to do ministry in post-COVID-19, we've got to create new access points to our churches. In other words, watch this. The fact that the doors are closed doesn't exempt us from engaging in ministry. Now what it does is it, it causes us to engage our creative thinking and decide to create new ways to, to gain access to do ministry. Mm, somebody doesn't get it. The building is closed, but watch this. The ministry is open for business as usual. Can I help somebody in here now? Now that the, that the doors are closed, we are relying on, uh, on technology uh, and social media to get the word out. But that's just one way. Uh, that's one point of access to do ministry. There are other ways. How about drive-bys? Drive by somebody's house that you know need some food and drop some stuff off or some stuff off. I call them on the phone and say, baby, is there anything, especially our senior citizens, is there anything we can do for you? Check on our young people. How are they doing navigating through this COVID-19 pandemic and being at home engaged in virtual instruction? I check on one another. See how people are doing. Look out for those who are living alone, who don't have anybody in the house check on them and see how they're doing there are ample opportunities laity and clergy of the southwest texas conference to actually engage in new forms of ministry and here is the interesting thing and i get excited about this lynn there are no written rules in fact we can make them up as we go i know that may sound risky that may sound kind of edgy but guess what that's exactly what our lord and savior jesus did he made new rules 
tongues. He made up stuff as he went, all to try to get people reconciled to him. And so I'm asking you right now, as I get ready to put this microphone down and we move to the next part of this session, are you willing, clergy and laity of the Southwest Texas Conference, to do ministry in a new way? Are you ready to do it however we have to do it, however, however long we have to do it, however, however which way we have to do it? Are we ready to do it by any means necessary? The fact of the matter is there's a dying world out there. They need to hear a word. They need to know that God is alive, large, and in charge. And if we don't engage in cutting edge ministry, the, ne the message will never get out. I'm going to ask you now, are you ready to engage in whatever it takes? Energizing ministry in a new way. And as I would say at Crosswork, if you were here on Sunday morning, and so ends the lecture for the evening. May God bless you. Now, let me confess to you that I didn't intend to deliver that word like that. Uh, I intended to deliver it in a much calmer, tamer, quieter way. But when I think about the opportunities that are out there to do ministry, I get excited. This is a great opportunity for all of us to maximize our impact from the laity to the clergy. But how much more of an impact would we make? How much more of a deposit on the kingdom would we make if we did it together? Amen? Now, this is part of our service where we um, offer the invitation to someone who perhaps doesn't have a relationship with God. Maybe you don't have that relationship. We want to give you an opportunity to have that relationship right now. Whether you're looking on Facebook or watching through YouTube or the 10th District website, this is an opportunity for you. This is ministry actually right now, giving opportunities for those who don't know who Jesus is to get to know him and have a relationship with God. For the word says that Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No person comes to the Father except through me. So we want to give you that opportunity right now. If you want that opportunity, I would invite you to repeat a prayer after me. We'll pray it really quickly, and you'll have this relationship. Repeat after me. Dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. I know that he died, but rose again on the third day with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. I invite him now to become my Lord and my Savior, and I accept him as such. Thank you, God for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations, you have the relationship. Now you're ready to go out and do effective ministry. You're ready to do, take that whatever it takes attitude by any means necessary and let's spread the word and, and establish God's kingdom here on earth. Now one last, one last uh, appeal, one last appeal here, and that is if you don't have a church home, no matter what city you're in, do me a favor, type in the comment section. Whatever city you're in, if you would like a church home, watch this when you type your name and the city and uh, perhaps your, your um, email address. Someone, one pastor from, from one, one lay person, uh, watch this, it's not just for the pastors now. One lay person can reach out to you and tell you and introduce you to their pastor. 
and then they will get you involved in the church. I know that there are a number of pastors in the Southwest Texas Annual Conference that would love to have you to have members. Watch this, and let me just say it, and you don't have to even live in Texas. Yes, I said that. There are a number of pastors who would love to pastor you from all over the world. Just type your name so that we can get in touch with you or some laypersons, friends of yours perhaps, can get in touch with you and get you to the right church. May God bless you and keep you. Let's go do ministry at a whole new level. God bless you. Hello. Thank you guys so much for worshiping us today during the late hour at the Southwest Texas Conference. I would like to thank all the participants on program and all the people that worked in the background to ensure that we had a smooth uh, but unique transition. Um, thank you guys so much. I want to remind you to contribute to our late hour. We're all we're asking for is $24, $25 and you pay it through 10th District Cash App or Giveify. And again, I wanna say thank you so much for coming out and supporting the lay. Next, I'm gonna introduce the newly uh, um, elected president for the 10th Episcopal District, which is Dr. Roderick Moore. Greetings to Bishop Vashti Murphy McKenzie, Supervisor Dr. Stan McKenzie, Presiding Elders Pamela Rivera and Dr. Raymond Bryant, Conference President Ms. Vanessa Crawford, officers, laity, members, and visitors of the best conference of the 17th session of the Southwest Texas Annual Conference. I would like to thank all of the participants on the program in the Southwest Texas Conference for another great year. And I look forward to working together with both the lay and clergy in a more confidence and excellent way. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Southwest Texas the Annual Conference May God continue to bless each of you in your call to serve and witness. Now I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our bishop today. She is the 117th elected and consecrated bishop of the AME Church. She's a trailblazer, author, educator, leader, innovator, electrifying preacher, and the first female bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, who is humble and grateful for, to God for the many opportunities and blessings afforded to her as she strives to serve with excellence. Please help me to welcome our bishop, Vashti Murphy McKenzie. 